Check, check. Okay. Okay. So, uh, thank you all for coming. This is our first talk in this session. Uh, so, uh, we'll, we'll be going, this talk is titled, uh, Composability Through Multiple Inheritance, uh, presented by Wukash Landiga. Uh, it'll be a 30-minute talk, and uh, with five minutes dedicated to Q&A at the end. Uh, please give a warm applause for Wukash Landiga. Hello there. The story I'm about to give is maybe somewhat sad, maybe somewhat scary, but hopefully there's a happy ending to all of it. So um, let's start. Traditionally, dramas start with Act 1, exposition, where we actually meet the characters we are about to uh, witness having certain trouble and the world they live in. So let me start with the greatest composability cliche ever, Lego bricks. Basically, um, it's still considered one of the greatest tools uh, even adult engineers can use to build certain structures. Uh, maybe 3D printers will change that, but still it's the easiest to go to a Lego store, just buy some bricks and compose whatever you want. Uh, it's actually quite a good example of what composability is all about. So let me just uh, bring you a couple of um, a couple of dry words and what what they mean, what I think they mean. Composability. Composability is a system design principle that deals with interrelationship of components. That means that a highly composable system provides recombinant components that can be selected and assembled in various combinations to satisfy specific requirements. Okay, so um, lots of lots of talk and you can obviously see that the Lego bricks are naturally designed as composable. But apart from composability, you have also compositionality, which is somewhat similar but not quite. Because the principle of compositionality is that the meaning of a complex expression can be determined by the meanings of its constituent expressions and the rules used to combine them. That means you can call that also uh, the Frege's principle because Gottlob Frege is widely credited for the first modern formulation of this principle. Uh, but theory is not why we all came here. So let me give you a real world example. Unix pipes. Everybody uses them, and actually, they are another great example of what composability is all about. As you can see, the commands that we input in those streams are those constituent expressions I defined before, and also they state recombinant components that you can actually use to build uh, complex structures to actually change the meaning of uh, what you're about to run. And the pipes themselves, these are the rules used to combine the components. So they define the interrelationship between components. And going back to the Lego bricks for a while, uh, Gottfried Kirk Christiansen is a guy widely uh, considered as the um, originator, the creator, the inventor of Lego bricks. And from his patent, you can already see that the only thing that he actually defined there is what we can see as the framework for composability. It all works very well for engineering as well. Let me give you another guy. This is Joe Armstrong. He created the programming language Erlang. Uh, he's known to say that it's really weird that we have very few programming languages that describe the interaction between things. I'd like to make components and I'd like to make software just by connecting them together. He said, take a grep, for example. Seen from the outside, imagine a little square, a black box. It has an input, which is a file. It has an input, which is a regular expression, and an output, which is a stream of lines that match the regular expression. At a perceptual level, understanding what grep does is extremely simple. That's not to say, that uh, the algorithm inside the black box is simple. It could be exceedingly complicated. 
when we connect things together through programming language APIs, we are not getting this black box abstraction. It becomes appallingly complicated to understand. People should connect things together in simple ways. And I agree. So we have composability, compositionality. But we could possibly come up with solutions for both of those which are of pure quality. Because this is like the third foundation that really gathers us here and not in our conference for another programming language. Uh, we strive for quality. Even the Zen of Python tells us that beautiful is better than ugly. And indeed, uh, everything can be made better, <laughs> but actually worse and at the same time. So let me give you an example of a philosopher. Robert M. Persig, I don't know if you know the guy. If you don't, you should. You totally should, because he's great. He wrote the um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is kind of like a Bible for the reasonable man, I'd say. Like, it's, a, it's a terrific book. You, you should totally read it. And if you're a father, like I am, you should totally read it like twice, because it, it works on so many levels. Um, Robert said in his book that we have artists with no scientific knowledge and scientists with no artistic knowledge and both with no spiritual sense of gravity at all. The result is not only bad, it is ghastly. The thing that Robert was after is quality with a grand Q. He said that peace of mind is, isn't at all superficial to technical work. It's just the whole thing. That which produces it is good work, and that which destroys it is bad work. Another guy, last one I promise, Jamie Zawinski, said basically the same thing, but using uh, words that are very, very, very um, understandable at a programming level, that you can have a piece of text describing something that describes it correctly, and it can be described well with some flair. And that the same thing is true for programs. It can get the job done, or it can also make sense, be put together well. To a large degree, tasteful and maintainable are similar, or at least very closely related. So we have those three, composability, compositionality, and quality. And we strive to actually get those three together to build systems that will sustain um, further development and extension. So what are the tools that we can use when we think of uh, composability in Python? This is the act two. We learn how inheritance in Python works, which is only one of the possible tools for uh, creating components. The other one, I believe, will be presented in the following talk. Uh, so that gives you kind of a broad perspective on how you can approach building software. Um, this is going to be on hands, really. So hands on, really. So uh, let me just start with saying we will not discuss old style classes. Obsolete, really. So forget it. Let me just start by creating a very simple class. This class derives from object. And already, as we can see, the method resolution order for it has two elements. Our class, A, and the object class. So that means the simplest you can get is a two-member uh, in, um, inheritance hierarchy in Python. What if we uh, did some more complex inheritance hierarchy then? Let us define Two classes, A and B, both very simple, uh, both inherit, uh, in inheriting from object. But the third one composes both together. At this point, you can already see and you can already feel that we're arriving at what the C++ developers dread, the diamond problem. Actually, the diamond problem means that if you have methods defined wherever in the, this graph, you cannot be sure how to resolve them. But for instance, in Python, there is a solution for that problem. And that solution is the C3 linearization algorithm introduced in Python 2.3 that, make uh, that makes it quite reasonable to um, 
reason about the order of methods that can be uh, resolved um, on runtime. In this example, you have the AB um, class, which is um, the mostly deeply nested, and then A, and then AB, and then object. Uh, what you can see is that Python actually defines this order as, um, as linear. So there are, not, uh, there are no trees there, there are no uh, cycles there. It's only a straight line. The way that it's built, basically, um, is that the order of specifying the base classes matters. For instance, if you would be to define two classes, AB and BA, you can see that both of them differ in the order of methods that are resolved. So, these are basically classes that are derived from one another, but don't really get anything done together. To do that, uh, most of the time, you specify some arguments uh, while instantiating a class. So what can we do to actually make both pieces work together? The traditional, old way, which is still widely used for that regard, is to simply state the base class explicitly and run the init method on it. So we can do actually uh, both initializations and end up with uh, what we actually could presume is the correct behavior. Uh, if we were to create even a more nested class structure, it gets really complex really fast. For instance, here we have class C that derives from a not, uh, yet undefined class D and, a, and the class AB we defined before. Uh, here we simply split the argument passed to pass it to the base AB class. As you can see, it works, but the method resolution order starts to be quite complex. We have the class C, the class D, AB, AB, and object. So it's quite long already. And what happens if the D class, which we don't know anything about because as we uh, defined in the uh, first act, composition is about black boxes. What if the D class actually uses class A as well? At that point, things stop being so straightforward. So the solutions for that were to introduce a new construct called super, which basically means we don't really care how the base classes were defined. We only state super AB, so super of our class, in it, and do whatever you have to do for that to work. So the naive approach to change our previous implementation to the new one would be simply to uh, change the uh, explicit init invocations to super. But as it turns out, that doesn't really work because the method resolution order is linear. So if you have a structure that is already so deeply nested, we know that um, we will approach an init invocation that doesn't accept the argument that is passed. Yes, this is the culprit in itself. That means we have to somehow, by building our classes, already know that they will be used, they're gonna be used as components. And by that I mean we have to accept keyword arguments regardless of whether we use them. And it is only needed because super will pass those arguments on to other base classes. That makes it kind of ugly, that makes it kind of explicit, but this is what we're left with our uh, class implementation. For instance, here, by specifying the keyword arguments, uh, they are gonna be passed correctly uh, here. But still, I'm not sure whether it's so clear for you. When I read it, it's not so clear for me, because I think <laughs> this is hard 
because the last example didn't work yet. You still have to explicitly pass arguments around so that they know where they are, where they are going to be passed. And the best part of it all is that while this example in this stage already works, it still, uh, it still behaves differently than the explicit init example. Because the, second argument is, uh, the, the first argument is different. So uh, let me just sum this all up by saying that if you are going to use multiple inheritance, you don't omit super ever. You don't omit init ever, even if your base class is object. You can't assume what arguments you're going to get in your init method, and you can't assume uh, what arguments you should pass to the super you're stating, because the method resolution order is resolved at runtime. So always pass all arguments you received, and if classes can take differing arguments, which is quite often really, always accept keyword arguments. And one last thing, if you mix class init and super, you're gonna have a bad time. And I mean, seriously, don't do it. The way to actually kind of escape all this complexity is to use mixins, right? Mixins, not meant for instantiation on your own, simply adding new functionality like Batman's utility belt, so they enhance classes with independent functionality. Great. They are not a form of specialization. They are simply a collections of functionality. They are like Java interfaces. They have built-in implementation, whatever, whatever. They are very usable, but only if they're orthogonal to the main type. And then you still have to remember that there is this method resolution order thing, which means that basically you have to always place mixins first. It may, it may look quite strange when you mix in stuff before the actual base class that states your object. So it's not, no longer like model, uh, comma, with name but it's with name, comma, modal. But that way you ensure that if the authors of your main classes didn't really uh, think of reusability, it'll still work because the method resolution order uh, takes order of the base classes uh, when it is constructed. Just a minute to say that <laughs> it'll be great to fix it and actually, I'm talking with uh, Amari Augustin to actually make it uh, quite better in the next versions of Django, but currently, what I said about the diamond problem non-existing is not true for Django, really. Uh, let me define a simple abstract model. Let me call it titled. It defines a single field and a Unicode method so that our models already uh, are kind of descriptive when you're using the shell or something like that. But this is only an abstract model. If we want to have something that actually makes it usable, we have to create a concrete model. But I'd say titled, what can be titled? Uh, videos can be titled, songs can be titled, but both of them also have stuff like Duration, they're dynamic, right? So let's create another abstract uh, model that's dynamic content, it has duration. And if you then create your concrete model called video, which is titled and which has dynamic content, what you'll get is cannot create a consistent method resolution order. If we come back for a while to that, we'll see that Ah, yes, this is what I already told you, that mixins actually have to be ordered the other way around. So let, let's just try to um, change the order. Okay, now the dynamic content comes first and title comes next. No, it still doesn't work because you get a duplicate column because this is how the meta classes currently define uh, fields for models there is a kind of an icky workaround, which is you have to dig deeper and see how the dynamic content model is defined. And when you see that, ah, okay, so it uses the abstract model I was going to use anyway, 
you simply omit it. In that case, we omit, uh, omit title because it's already defined and it starts working suddenly. Uh, why that is ugly is because uh, it means you cannot really have this black box approach where you don't really care how those uh, models are defined, but you only care about the functionality. But this is where we are stuck at the moment. But it gets better. Uh, polymorphism is all about um, different content which is kind of alike, which is really simple to get when you're using an uh, inheritance because we can define another class, which is song, kind of different from video, but still it's dynamic content, and um, define a couple of models for that. But it would be really great if we could simply say, return all dynamic content regardless of whether they are songs or videos, with titles starting with something, right? Unfortunately, does, that doesn't work currently. Abstract models cannot be used um, as actual models anywhere. The workaround for it is a small library I wrote, which actually uh, lets you chain multiple um, iterables together. They don't, really, they don't actually have to be um, query sets even, but it helps if they are. Um, Using that library, you can go around it and uh, use polymorphism with Django as well. A little thought about polymorphism is that it's tightly related to the list of substitution principle, which states that if S is a subtype of T, then objects of type T may be replaced with objects of type S. Objects of type S may be substituted for objects of type T without altering any of the desirable properties of the program. This is totally untrue for Django in its current state. So if you're going to use classes for composability, for composition, you have to take all those things um, and yeah, you have to think about all those things. The last thing I want to show you is that actually I tried really hard to come up with um, a library of reusable components for Django. And I'm happy to say that I kind of succeeded. Some implementation details are really ugly, and I mean really ugly, but still it's in production for multiple months now, multiple years now maybe, and it works quite well. Uh, you can actually get it all. Uh, it's called LCK Django. And it defines all sorts of boring classes like named, titled, slugged, and stuff. But there's a single class I wanted to talk about um, for just a minute. Time trackable. I increasingly think that most of the objects that we do serialize, that we do preserve, should have some information on when they were created and when they were last modified, like files. The file system has that functionality for a reason. So I defined a base model which, does, which simply does that. But in time, it grew quite a lot of functionality around the notion of um, tracking created and modified date times. The reason for that is um, Simon Wilson, uh, when he described how Lanyard works, said that basically uh, it's done by caching everything and serving everything for, uh, from a search index. To do that, you have to really know whether an, uh, an object changed. So to do that, you have to track um, which changes actually um, invalidate the cache. So I dug around and um, what I came up with is that, yeah, you can simply create a next field on the time trackable model, which is cache version, and simply uh, increment it whenever something significant changes. Uh, that only left me with implementing a dirty fields functionality, which can show you which fields are already changed uh, compared to the model in the database, and so on, and so on, and so on. So currently, it's kind of a complex thing already, but you can use it 
and reuse it and reuse it in every project you are going to use, uh, you to, to write. So that means you're left without having to think about this functionality on and on. This only left me with stuff like prioritized saves and um, localization, display counters, soft deletions, and stuff like that. There are more uh, um, applications there in LCK Django, but the reason for, for that is uh, you don't have to actually think about how the implementation looks like, which is at times really ugly. The last, the last, the very last thing I want to show you is the implementation of the um, time trackable model, which is already quite complex. It already has like, I don't know, 300 lines maybe. The tests are quite long as well. You don't have to think about it. You simply reuse it as if it was a part of Django from day one. Going back to the presentation, um, there's lots of other things I, I could probably like show off from the library, but not in the time frame I got. So let me simply say, at, just so you know, this patent is yet another example of a bastard that was first to patent something, but he wasn't the inventor. Because actually, yes, this is the original Lego bricks. Unfortunately, not patented. Those guys uh, went bankrupt and now do other things. While Christiansen went on with a great fortune for not inventing, by, but patenting basically the same design. One last thing. Jamie said, if you don't understand how something works, ask someone who does. A lot of people are skittish about it, and it doesn't help anybody. Not knowing something doesn't mean you're dumb. It just means you don't know it yet. I felt like that while digging around super and multiple inheritance. So if there's anything I want you to remember from that talk is that if there's anything you don't know already, doesn't mean you're dumb. It just means you don't know it yet. Thank you. Okay. So, if we have any questions, uh, there's a microphone right here in the center here. If you could please walk up to it so we can record your question for videos that are posted later. So when you're passing the star star to K KW args around between all of the inits, what if you have two different uh, constructors that both take an argument with the same name? Uh, yeah, so then the black box actually falls apart and you have to know what is the order of the argument. And this is the reason why the super example was different from the init one. Because yes, the order mattered and we, we were left with uh, another instantiation of the same argument. So yes, th this is a valid problem and the uh, even more tricky uh, part of it is that it comes silent. You will never know. It will simply be defined as one of the uh, values, but which you have to know the MRO. Well, if you're pulling them out of the star KWRs, yep. as, you, as you use them, then you've consumed it in the first one, and the second one doesn't receive it, and if it's a required uh -huh. parameter, then you'll know because it'll fail, because it didn't get a required Yes, then it'll parameter. fail, yep. If we're changing all the constructors to take basically the same signature, how do we keep them to have some form of ability to describe how to use them? Uh, yes. Basically, this is why you want to use Python 3. <laughs> because uh, in Python 3, you can use uh, all sorts of um, stuff that helps with that. Let me just tell you about uh, keyword-only arguments or, um, yeah, keyword-only arguments is, is one thing. Basically, what I'm approaching myself uh, is that each and everything I want to use in my class, I define explicitly. And whatever I'm not aware that will be passed, I leave for um, asterisk args and double asterisk keyword args. Okay, well that's all the time we have for questions. Please give a Big round of applause for our speaker. <laughs>